the main crunch of this talk, which is the fine art of practicing bubble CPAP. I mentioned earlier, it doesn't happen overnight. And I would like to share some practical aspects of nasal CPAP application in the next 10, 15 minutes and share with you some strategies for success. I refer to them as 10 pearls of bubble nasal CPAP success. First and the foremost, choosing the appropriate size of nasal prong. Choose the correct size of prong in order to provide effective nasal CPAP and, and avoid erosion of the nasal septum. Both Hudson and Bobby Plus have recommended prong sizes by weight. Other manufacturers also have recommendations for the individual prong size. The correct size of prongs should snugly fit into infant's nares without pinching the septum or causing any blanching. How should you fix the nasal interface? Uh, the circuit tubing can be fixed easily with a snugly fitting cap with rubber bands and Velcro, uh, rubber bands and safety pins, or one can use Velcro. In bigger infants, curly bandage can help to maintain the shape of the head while the infant is on CPAP. And the bottom line is when secure, the interface should move when the baby moves the head. So everything should move all together. <clears throat> Further, to secure the nasal interface, one can use a pre-cut single or a split Velcro mustache. This, and this is the rough surface of the Velcro, um, which gets placed on the skin. And then the smooth part of the Velcro is placed on the nasal cannula as shown. And what you want to make sure is after you put the prongs, in the nostrils, then there should be a space between the nasal septum and the nasal cannula. That is the crucial thing. And I think that's one thing which keeps <clears throat> the incidence of septal injury very, very low or almost none at Columbia University. Tegaderm and duoderm, thin duoderm base can assist in stabilizing the mustache and the cannula, particularly if the infant has a lot of secretions. Homemade seal or commercially available if you have enough finances, uh, cannulity can be used to obtain a good nasal seal. Mustache and nasal cannula, I keep say, I will repeat this multiple times, should never, never touch the septum. When properly positioned, the corrugated tubing should no, 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 not touch infant skin. There should be no lateral pressure on the nasal septum and a small space should always be present between the tip of the septum and the nasal cannula connecting the prongs. How can you optimize the CPAP delivery? A small neck roll goes a long way under the infant's neck to prevent neck flexion and airway obstruction. Chin straps, as shown here, or pacifiers can be applied as needed to maintain airway pressure. They can also decrease the leak of, from the gases and they promote bubbling. Importantly, um, vigilant care is needed to ensure correct positioning of the CPAP prongs at all times to avoid septal irritation. The nasal cavities, oropharynx, and stomach should be gently suctioned every three to four hours as needed to improve ventilation and decrease abdominal distension. When you're performing nasal or oral suctioning, prior to removing the prongs, one should ensure to cover the eyes this will prevent contaminations from nasal secretion. Infant's position should be changed every three hours. Infant can be prone, placed prone, supine, or lateral. All positions are acceptable. But again, always ensure that there is no lat additional pressure on the nasal septum or the face from the tubing. It is essential to systematically check the CPAP delivery system multiple times during the day. The inspired gases should be well humidified with temperature around 37 degrees to prevent irritation of mucous membranes, avoid mucus plugging, and to mobilize the secretion. The condensed water in the tubing should be periodically drained as needed. One has to ensure that the distal end of the expiratory tube is always insert, inserted to the appropriate length below the liquid surface in the bubbler so that you're generating the desired CPAP. The liquid in the bubble, bubbler can be either sterile water, 
or we use 20.25% acetic acid, uh, which has the potential to decrease the risk for pseudomonas infection. And we recommend that the nasal CPAP circuit should be changed at least once a week. One has to ensure that there is no gastric distension for which a feeding tube should be placed to permit gastric venting and decompression. This decreases the excessive pressure from the diaphragm and improves the lung expansion. The tube should be suctioned every three hours if infant is not enterally fed or before feeds if the infant is being fed. And we tend to check the tube position and patency every 12 hours. If infant is on CPAP, infant can be fed via nipple, cavage, or continuous feed. CPAP is not a contraindication for not feeding. Also, early parental involvement in nipple feeding while the infant is still on nasal CPAP, it facilitates the bonding for same reason, and skin-to-skin -skin care is to be encouraged when infant is on nasal CPAP, as you see in the picture shown above. Coming to how to wean nasal CPAP, I'm going to share you the stability criteria for redness of nasal CPAP when we weed at Columbia. You know, for me, the best indicator is when the nurses, they give the bath at the nighttime, they leave me a message saying, this baby is ready for um, coming off CPAP. But we have objective criteria. We wean CPAP only after infants are more than 30 weeks. They're not on any supplemental oxygen for at least 48 hours. They are completely asymptomatic with PDA, which could be there still. There are no apneic episodes. There's no suggestion of infection. There's no significant bradycardia or desaturation that require intervention. Less than two self-limiting bradycardia or desaturations in the past 12 hours are okay. And the oxygen saturation has to be more than 90% on room air. How do we wean? Um, it has been done using three different approaches. You can completely take off CPAP when the infant is stable on room air without any respiratory distress. Um, um, you can cycle where the infant comes off for a period and then goes back, gradually increasing the time off and reducing the time on. And this way, infant can be completely weaned off. And the third method is switching to a nasal flow, nasal cannula uh, when the CPAP is off. Uh, but we, we don't know what pressures we are giving with this nasal cannula. Um, so uh, has this been evaluated? Uh, these methods have been evaluated nicely um, uh, in a randomized control trial, looking at all these three methods. And it was very clear that method one, which is complete wean with intentions to stay off, it resulted in lower time to wean, lesser total number of days on CPAP, supplemental oxygen, lower incidence of BPD, and even the length of hospitalization was decreased and infants were discharged at a much lower corrected gestational age. So if you're going to wean, we do the same. <clears throat> uh, we wean infants off with intentions to keep the infants off once the infant. Obviously, um, I'll talk about uh, managing the failure in a minute, but another important aspect is avoiding the potential complications um, with CPAP use. These complications include nasal obstruction from secretion or improper application of nasal prongs, gastric distension from swallowing of excessive air, nasal septum erosion as shown here. Um, this could be prevented by choosing the right size, vigilant care to keep the cannula off the nasal septum at all time. I've seen in some of the units, they try to put something. This is an absolute no-no. The small surface area, if you protect it over here, if even there is a little pressure, it's really going, because of its small nature, it's going to put a lot of pressure and there will be septum. So these two are definitely a no-no. How do you antify and manage nasal CPAP? CPAP failure can occur during the acute phase of RDS or during the recovery when nasal CPAP is being used to wean. CPAP prior to starting vent mechanical ventilation, is it, it is important and imperative to ensure, number one, the blood gases are compatible with the, how the infant looks. Before you abandon CPAP, it is important to rule out the improper application of CPAP 
poor fitting prongs, nasal obstruction due to secretion, airway obstruction from flex neck, gastric distension, and too frequent handling of an unstable infant also doesn't help. If the CPAP system is felt to be working properly and oxygen is still in, in, in inadequate, in select group of infants, um, may, they may benefit from increasing the end expiratory pressure to up to, we use up to eight millimeters of mercury. CPAP failure can occur immediately after weaning, or coming off CPAP, or as late as 12 to 24 hours later. If the infant is experiencing frequent episodes of apnea, bradycardia, desaturation, or develops distress while off CPAP, the CPAP should be should be taken. Um, if it, this happens while the baby is off, then the CPAP should be placed back again. So to summarize the use of CPAP, here are some take home practice points. Use of nasal CPAP as an initial mode of respiratory support in critically ill, very low birth weight infants is associated with lower incidence of chronic lung disease. Short binasal prongs are effective and convenient patient device interfaces for delivery of CPAP in newborn infants with respiratory distress. Bubble nasal CPAP represents the simplest form of CPAP that may offer physiological advantage over other CPAP system because of its effective lung volume recruitment and efficient gas exchange in the presence of low lung compliance. Use of correct CPAP devices attention to details during CPAP delivery and bedside care giver experience are the key to nasal CPAP success.